is time now to catch up with cancer historian Dr Timothy Bottoms. Hi, Timothy. How are you this very good morning? Oh, yes, I'm in fine fettle. Mm. Now, we're going to look at the early days of the township of Cairns. Can you give us an indication of, of what did occur in those early days? Well, there were quite a variety of um, expeditions travelling to the Cairns area, um, and even individuals coming up here. I mentioned those in earlier uh, episodes that we've been talking about. Um, we had uh, Ingham on in his flat-bottomed Louisa steamboat. Um, but uh, we also had uh, Native Mounted Police uh, troopers with uh, Sub-Inspector Johnson and Thompson exploring the region. Uh, and uh, quite a variety of uh, efforts made to come from the Hodgkinson down to uh, Cairns. Uh, well, Cairns didn't exist at that stage, but they eventually met up and um, uh, at the end of the first week of um, 1876 uh, was the first official um, arrival here and establishment of uh, uh, the township of Thornton, but uh, that was only called Thornton by um, uh, Sh- uh, Sheridan, from uh, who was the police magistrate and customs uh, fellow from uh, Cardwell. He later became uh, the police magistrate in Cairns, but um, uh, Thornton flew out and they uh, named it after Cairns, the governor of Queensland. Um, but what basically you had was uh, it took quite a long time, 21 hours from Townsville to Cairns to come by steamship uh, and that's what made the big difference was that you didn't, you could use steamships could travel the inner uh, route uh, for the uh, Great Barrier Reef with uh, sailing ships they had to tack and that made it much more difficult right. and, and that's what encouraged people to move north apart from the obvious attraction of gold um, and uh, what you had was with uh, uh, Cairns, they had to wait until the surveyor, uh, official surveyor had come in and started surveying land before they could claim it. Of course, they totally ignored the traditional owners. Um, and uh, you had Smithfield finally uh, laid out Old Smithfield, not the one that we know now. Oh, OK. So where was Old Smithfield located? On the Barren River, uh, okay. right at the uh, end of the uh, navigable area, i.e. the depth of water meant the, the size of ships that could get up the river to that point. And uh, anyway, uh, it was established. It was doing great guns compared to Cairns because the packers could uh, feed their horses on the grass there, whereas they couldn't at Cairns. There wasn't any means to do that. Um, so... Smithfield was, Old Smithfield was going ahead quite uh, well, but at the same time, you had at um, uh, Island Point, um, you had the discovery of a, a dray track, which became the what we call the bump track, um, which is... Um, w- which was led inland to the Hodgkinson Goldfield. And uh, uh, Island Point, of course, was called Port Owen, Terrigal, Owenville, Port Salisbury, eventually Port Douglas. And uh, Port Douglas was usurping Cairns as the main centre. Uh, Why was that? Well, because of the dray. Uh, They could actually use carts to get up uh, and over the range. They couldn't in Cairns. Uh, the, the the tracks they had found were just that tracks, and most of them were based on uh, uh, bummer uh, walking pads. When was this? This was in the the eighteen eighties. Eighteen seventy six. Right. Um, and it's uh, Port Douglas started to sort of usurp Cairns during the late eighteen seventies. Uh, Cairns was pretty depressed in eighteen eighty one, eighty two. Um, however. It had uh, the spark of uh, Chinese investment with the Hapwa plantation around roughly the Earlville area today, and that was the start of uh, really the first agriculture that um, in the Cairns district was started by the the Chinese, led by uh, Andrew Leon, who was the representative of the Chinese. He communicated with the Europeans in the area, and it was that which kick-started uh, or kept cans going when all the European banks, the native police and all the rest of it moved to Port Douglas. But they started to come back um, once uh, they found other means 
chance to uh, get to uh, get to the Cairns area, to Trinity Inlet, to load onto ships to go south or north. Um, for example, you had um, uh, you had the um, from uh, let's see, uh, Herbert and Tinfield. Uh, they were packing the tin down to Cairns and then packing goods back up the range. That's roughly in the... They used to go in the area where the Gillies Highway is now located. And uh, there were two or three tracks uh, in that area. Um, And uh, that's how they moved in those days, was with pack horses. Um, Timothy, would you say that there was any one development that kick-started Cairns' growing prosperity? Well, certainly. It was the railway. Um... And they started looking from about 1882, 83 onwards. Um, and, uh, in fact, um, the uh, Minister for Works, um, Macrossan, uh, he, uh, he uh, employed um, Christy Palmerston and his sidekick, Pompo, to search. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that there's uh, another story in this somehow because um, Palmerston had been um, engaged by the Marillion Harbour um, local government to find uh, a, a, a track o- over the range. But they shortchanged him and didn't pay him. And if you look now where the Palmerston Highway is, it's a far better gradient for uh, a railway. Um, but he kept quiet about it. So I think that the uh, it's a possibility. I haven't done enough research on it to, to come out categorically, but I think probably uh, the Baron Gorge um, Railway probably wouldn't have happened if he'd talked about uh, what became the Palmerston Highway because that ridge line going up to the Tablelands is much, much easier as far as gradients go. All right. Well, that's fascinating. We're running out of time, though. So next week we're going to continue on a little bit. um, You might talk about how the frontier expands, will you, just in a later time period? Yes, indeed. Although I I think it's worth mentioning with the Chinese, of course, that we had uh, Sack Street, which was the red light district of Cairns where the opium dens were and and there were some brothels. Um, That was really incredible because they wanted to change the name and get rid of the red light district. And they did that in 1936 where um, uh, they wanted to honour one of the aldermen. And then they realised, possibly it wasn't a good idea to change the name to Alderman Hall. <laughs> so right. they chose Grafton Street instead. <laughs> ah, that's all right. Fascinating stuff, Timothy. Thank you for coming in on this Saturday morning. My pleasure.